Let's get started. Uh, so welcome everybody. My name is Ali Narani. I'm the president and the CEO of the National Immigration Forum. And I really wanna thank our panelists for joining today. I wanna thank everybody who is watching uh, for, for joining as well. And uh, before I go any further, I just wanna really encourage folks uh, to, as we go through this conversation, uh, to please put some questions if you have them in the chat. And as we go through the conversation, I'll make sure that I pull them in. So the reason that we're uh, gathered today is that refugee resettlement in the United States has plummeted. It's at historic lows over the course of the Trump administration so that only 10,200 new refugees were settled in the United States in the last fiscal year, down from about 30,000 the previous year and about 85,000 per year uh, during, uh, at least in President Obama's last year in office. This fiscal year's refugee ceiling of 15,000 is the lowest since the U.S. Refugee Resettlement Program began in 1980. Globally, today, according to the UNHCR, there are nearly 80 million people forcibly displaced, including 26 million refugees. So for the United States to say that we as a nation are going to resettle at most 15,000 uh, is a failure. Um, it, it's a complete failure. Uh, but what we're here to talk about today is the opportunity the refugee resettlement brings to the United States from a national security perspective. We've got an incredible panel uh, that's gathered uh, um, that I'll introduce quickly and then we'll start the conversation. And again, please uh, add questions to the chat as we go through and I'll make sure that uh, we do everything we can to pull them in. Um, Elizabeth Newman is a senior advisor to the Forum on National Security Issues. Uh, she worked for the Trump administration as Assistant Secretary for Threat Prevention and Security Policy in the Office of Strategy, Policy, and Plans within the Department of Homeland Security. In that role, she had wide policy development and coordination responsibilities, including screening and, uh, for screening and vetting, terrorism prevention, counterterrorism, countering transition, transitional criminal organizations, and other persistent and emerging threats. She is the author of a new report they're releasing today looking specifically at this issue. Tyrone Sims is a combat veteran, businessman, political leader, and a graduate of the United States Military Academy at West Point. He has over a decade of experience in the Department of Defense, having served five years as an active duty army officer and another eight years as a government contractor. And then finally, Matthew Sorens is the U.S. Director of Church Mobilization and Advocacy for World Relief, where he helps, where he helps evangelical churches to understand the realities of refugees and immigration and to respond in ways guided by biblical values. He also serves as the national coordinator for the Evangelical Immigration Table. So let's get started. Elizabeth, let me kick the first question to you. And really, uh, uh, if you can spend a few minutes kind of painting a picture of what you found in your, your work to develop this report. Absolutely. First, let me thank the forum and, and Ali and the, Jacinta and Dan and the staff. Um, I'm really just honored to be able to participate in this dialogue. Uh, I think it's an important dialogue. Uh, the last few years of security have been focused, uh, or security has been used as a justification to cloak nativism, xenophobia, and racism. It wasn't apparent to me personally in the beginning. I think it was uh, uh, apparent to others, but it, it, uh, over time it became very apparent to me that um, security was just an excuse. Uh, the, the Biden administration has promised to reopen the U.S. and, and welcome immigrants, making um, uh, it, it promises to restore one of the great things uh, I think uh, we have about our country that we are um, have historically been a welcoming country. Uh, that said, I, I think it's important to recognize that um, our history with immigration is riddled with pendulum swings between welcoming and unwelcoming, and often behind the unwelcoming. Um, those that have, you know, maybe natural nativist um, or xenophobic tendencies have often historically used security as the reasoning for that pendulum swing. Um, so part of my hope in, in writing this document is to be able to uh, push back against some of those arguments. Um, security is absolutely important. I'm a security professional and there are um, important recommendations in this paper about what we can do to enhance security. Uh, but I, I hope that I'm laying out the case, not only uh, are, are, uh, can we be both welcoming and have security uh, that's not, um, uh, it, in some ways, is two sides of the same coin, because uh, by being welcoming, it helps us with our national security posture overseas. 
Um, so I, I, I think uh, if I just run through a, a handful of the recommendations and I'm happy to take questions on them. Um, I, I start with uh, embracing what the Biden administration has committed to do, which is increase uh, the refugee ceiling. Uh, I, I wholeheartedly support that. Um, they are calling for uh, raising it to a historic high, which I think is wonderful. Um, I, I think it's also important to communicate what is operationally feasible given the current security bidding constraints, as well as some of the infrastructure challenges that the US Refugee Admissions Program uh, faces. Um, and to that end, I, I point out and I um, rely heavily upon some good work that was done over the summer and fall by the National Conference on Citizenship and the Penn Biden Center for Diplomacy and Global Engagement. They released a report in late October called A Roadmap to Rebuilding the U.S. Refugee Admissions Program. And their paper is primarily focused on the infrastructure challenges within the whole system, things like technology and staffing, and they make a whole series of recommendations of what needs to happen in order to build that infrastructure. Um, they, they make the point both that it, it was, um, it needed help four years ago, but certainly um, as the uh, refugee ceiling has declined, um, there's been less uh, investment in both by partners as well as federal government agencies in the refugee program. So there's a number of not exciting, but really important infrastructure work that needs to happen in order for the system to be able to process at historic levels. Um, so I, I encourage uh, that uh, while it's not necessarily a, a national security issue, if you do not take care of those infrastructure challenges, then you're going to put pressure on a system that cannot perform. And, and that's where I get a little nervous that compromises could happen if, if the pressure becomes so great um, and pe people just make mistakes when they're stressed and when they're pressured. So let's, if, let's give them the, the budget, let's give them the technology and address some of those systemic problems so that we can uh, a process uh, not only at a historic high of 125,000, but hopefully beyond. Um, and one of the recommendations having uh, worked with the program the last few years that, that I think is common sense, it just makes sense to me that we move to a multi-year program uh, where we stop doing things on a year by year basis, but we project not only um, internally within the federal government, but to our partners where we think the trend line is going so that people can plan the way we like to plan multi-year as opposed to the uh, year by year process that we currently address. The other um, thing, again, it's not very exciting, but it's just the reality. USCIS is fee funded. And those fee funds are significantly, that, that pool is significantly reduced because of the pandemic and, and some of the decisions that have been made by the administration to stop all immigration processing for the most part. Uh, so Congress is gonna have to act very quickly to provide the budget necessary to actually implement uh, the, the necessary um, funds uh, to be able to process 125,000 people in, in uh, fiscal year 21. Um, so that's kind of the, the premise. And then the rest of the recommendations get more into uh, key security areas. Uh, a big focus uh, is the National Vetting Center. And I, um, I wanna spend just a few moments on that. I, I, having worked on that, think that is absolutely key for speeding up the processes for many refugees that are stuck in what otherwise appears like an infinite do loop of security reviews. I realize that the National Vetting Center has an association with the Trump administration's extreme vetting policies, um, but the reality is, and this has been testified in, in uh, public settings, this is an implementation of a 9-11 commission recommendation to do information sharing and to be able to make sure that the holdings that the government has on the high side can be compared uh, to low side holdings. This, this is not, uh, this, this is the type of thing that I think the American public assume the government already does. Um, it was uh, an iteration on an immaturation of our information sharing policies that would have happened under uh, you know, a, a Hillary Clinton administration because it was just the natural next step. Um, so, so with that kind of premise that I, I believe it's not the boogeyman that many uh, think that it is, 
I would strongly recommend that the Biden administration send a strong signal to the various agencies that contribute to the National Vetting Center uh, to make sure that they prioritize funding uh, to make the NVC operational as fast as possible. Um, refugees is uh, in the list of uh, uh, population sets that are supposed to eventually be integrated. They need to prioritize refugees. And once you're able to do that, here's, here's the benefit to the refugee program. It will automate many of the lengthy manual security checks that are required for refugee processing, which will allow the background checks to go so much faster. And that might result in, in a no for certain uh, uh, applicants. But I, one of my big concerns in the current process is because uh, various security agencies aren't talking very effectively to one another, we end up putting a number of people on hold while uh, you know, they're looking for, for more clarification or resolving potentially derogatory information. And those people are spending years waiting for an answer. Um, so we have got to reduce the, uh, the length of time that it is taking to do those security checks, especially in the areas of the world where it is, it is more challenging for the security professionals to get uh, clarification on whether somebody poses a risk to the United States. Um, there are other recommendations related to how we can improve processing of the P2 recommendations, both uh, the current P2 population as well as anticipating future needs for a, a program like that, as well as developing um, more of a sustainable approach to our long-term security. And then I, finally, I, I close uh, the paper with a call to recognize that um, uh, the current global system is insufficient for the sc scope of the problem that we have with displaced persons. And the USX actions in the last four years have exacerbated that. Um, and I'm pleased to see that the Biden administration is gonna return to that global ta table, but we need to recognize that if we don't address these problems quickly, um, it allows resentment to foster. And as a CT professional, this is the type of thing that where you do worry, not necessarily about today's population, but that we're setting in place um, the, uh, the, the series of factors that can lead somebody to be vulnerable, uh, to be exploited by a criminal or a trafficker or a terrorist. Um, so addressing the problems today helps us 10, 15 years down the road from future uh, uh, populations of extremism. Great, thank you, Elizabeth. Um, Tarun, uh, you and when when you were in the service, you 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 know, uh, had spent a lot of time in in Iraq and, and other places, and in that way, you got to know many of the community members there who were working with the military. So, as of two thousand September of two thousand nineteen, it was estimated there were over one hundred and ten thousand Iraqis Iraqis waiting for resettlement in the U.S. And it would seem that you know the issue of identifying one hundred thousand refugees or more is not the issue of the presidential determination necessarily in terms of an increase, but the, the issue is really uh, speaking to the backlog of, of resettling uh, Iraqi, uh, Iraqis. So I was wondering if you might be able to speak to uh, some, uh, whether it's the P2 program that Elizabeth mentioned or even the special immigrant visa, but you know, from your perspective, what is contributing to the backlog here for resettlement, um, particularly uh, for folks who uh, our military worked with uh, um, you know, in the Middle East or elsewhere? Yeah, so thanks for the question, Ali. And I'm definitely not as, uh, an expert on Elizabeth's level by any stretch of imagination. So uh, my perspective is going to be uh, more from a personal perspective on how I've seen the system work with respect to uh, my attempts, uh, fortunately successful attempts of getting uh, Iraqi families into the United States. Um, um, not, no, not knowing fully the population of the people who are, who are participating on, or who are watching the panel right now, but for anyone who has not been to a refugee camp, it is probably the most uh, disheartening, saddening um, location experience you're gonna experience. There's probably some others that'd be up there, but it is, it's brutal. And the first one I ever saw, um, unfortunately the only one was um, on the Iraq, Iran border in the Wasik province. And this was the first time I realized that we had this, that, that our country had a real problem. This is the summer of 2004. Um, we discovered, it's a, there's a long story in this, so I'm definitely not gonna tell the story, but what we discovered um, when we found this refugee camp was that uh, United States and coalition provisional authority didn't really pay a, a whole lot of attention to 
um, Iraqis trying to get into Iran because a large number of the Shia population had family um, located in, in, in Western Iran. And uh, for those Iraqis who lived in, in, in cities like Baghdad, Baghdad and such, where, where I primarily was, um, was deployed during my 15 months in Iraq, um, you know, getting $2 w- wasn't that big of a deal. You go work um, on a, you know, a, on an army camp or something uh, for the day, make 2 to $5 and you're good. But the problem with this large population of folks at this ref- refugee camp couldn't scrounge together $2. And the importance of the $2 was because Sistani had recognized this issue of his people wanting to go to Iran to see their families and they didn't have $2. He made this uh, under the table agreement with the Iranian government that if they had $2, um, they would help them process paperwork and get them into Iran. Um, CPA in the United States blessed off on this. You probably never find any paperwork on this, um, but technically it was official. Uh, but it was sad because it was thousands and thousands of people sitting there, destitute, waiting for what I don't know, but trying to get over into Iran because that's where their family was. Um, you fast forward to um, really the point of, of the question, Ali, where um, things really were getting bad, as most people can imagine, um, after the uh, Battle of Sadr City and the Shia uprising in the April 2004. And a lot of the Iraqis who were working with coalition forces, primarily the United States, but Brits, uh, Spanish, Poles, Ukrainians, etc., cetera, uh, were being targeted um, primarily by Muqtada and his forces. And so uh, with their livelihoods at stake, and uh, we saw a lot of this, uh, where our, our interpreters were, were being murdered, our, our district and neighborhood council members were being murdered, uh, their desire was to either come to the United States or go to um, either Australia, New Zealand, uh, Germany, or other European countries where they already had family established. You know, those families who primarily left either in 77 or 91 um, when the Ba'ath Party took over and then with Saddam um, fully uh, okay. in strengthened himself in Iraq. Um, so I, the, my first interpreter who reached out to me, this might have been in 2005, and this was really weird to me. And this goes to the whole process with the P2 and the, and the S, SIV uh, process, right? And I understand our government wanting to ensure that we're not um, allowing, I don't know, unsafe persons, however that, or however you would define um, an individual who would purposely cause harm to our country, uh, not to want them to come into the country. But one of the criteria, which to me was like the roadblock to a large number of um, those Iraqis, and we'll throw Afghans into this conversation as well, um, who are attempting to come to the United States, who, who had worked with us um, in, a ver- in, in various fashions, not just as interpreters, um, right. was that they required a letter of recommendation from a general officer, right? So people who watch the news all the time, who haven't actually worked with the military, don't realize that you can go your entire career in the United States Army and never actually spend time with a general officer. So why would you expect an interpreter who's hung out with a squad who may be the highest ranking person he's, he's spent any time with might be a captain who is the troop or company or battery commander of that squad. How's he gonna get a letter of recommendation from a general officer? Now, fortunately for me, I had relationships and I could, quote unquote, get, (laughs) big quotes, um, general officers with whom I was, um, who were either mentors or friends of mine to uh, write letters that I, you know, either I had drafted or um, the Rexos would um, and get those processed um, and added into their packets. Uh, But too many did did not have that ability to do so. Uh, And so looking at that, aspect of the process, I'm like, well, uh, it it had me recall a conversation that um, the uh, team lead for a civil affairs team, Major Caffrey, had with me back when I was still a lieutenant during the early time in our our deployment. And what he feared Mm -hmm. was, this kind of goes back to one of Elizabeth's latter points with respect to national security is, you know, one of the failures of Vietnam was that we just up and left, right? And those South Vietnamese, who, who we, uh, 
who, who worked beside us, who believed in us, whether our cause was just or not. You know, it's a conversation for another day. You can watch the Ken Burn documentary if you want. But they, they, but they sacrificed something working with us and allying, our, uh, allying themselves with us. And we just up and, up and left and left them hanging, right? And we all know the history right. that happened with that. And so Major Caffrey's fear was that yep. the United States was going to end up doing the same thing to the Iraqis. And sadly, uh -huh. that's what happened. Um, and I look at that as a national security threat um, because we're going to end up in a country again, um, in a time of war, however that's defined, hopefully not for at least another 20, 30, 40 years, but it's gonna happen. And someone's gonna have history on that. And people are going to ask themselves, well, why should I help you when you didn't help those people? Or when you knew for a fact that, you know, these people's families were either killed or threatened with death. And when they had, an when you had an opportunity to help them, you didn't do the right thing. And yep. I believe that, um, again, taking some, some more of Elizabeth's thunder with the process, you know, in the modern era, and you're probably going to get into this later, Ali, but in the modern era, there's got to be a way to better streamline these processes. You know, we already know that um, right. this is more an orange grapefruit comparison that, you know, with um, the, the, uh, the background checks you have to do to get security clearances, you know, Right. Yeah. So before we get into the, the process questions, let's kind of like circle back through. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Thank you. So Matt, let me uh, turn to you. And this also came up in the chat as well, to a certain degree. Um, what are the steps that need to be taken to rebuild the organizational capacity for resettlement in order to hit this number so that not just people are served, but they're going through the vetting processes, et cetera. So whether those, that capacity is overseas, the work that you all are doing with partners um, or e even domestically. Up here on mute. Just one second. Sorry. Can you? Can you? Go ahead. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, yeah. So I I think that I'll I'll probably defer to our my colleagues here who are much more experts on the overseas processing side of what could improve. But it is important to note that on the resettlement side. Um, once pe refugees arrive in the U.S., that process is not a light switch either that turns off and on. And the reality is, of course, and I, you know, World Relief is one of those nine agencies that the State Department works with to resettle refugees in the U.S. Um, our capacity is, we've done the very best we can to keep it going, but the way the refugee resettlement process has been set up has been a public-private partnership. And the public side of that, basically, the, the floor fell out about four years ago. Um, so, you know, we went from a refugee ceiling of 110,000 to less, you know, less than half that immediately and it's declined. So just, you know, for World Relief, for example, 16 across our network, we about 8,350 refugees. By last year, we were settled 1,217 refugees. So it's about an 80% decline. And I think the other resettlement agencies have seen a similar rate of decline. And, you know, our, our funding model is at least partially from a federal grant from the State Department that's a per refugee grant. So you can do the math on how our funding has changed as well. And we, like the other resettlement agencies, have made the very difficult decisions to preserve as much of the infrastructure as we could. Um, but that for us has meant um, shutting down nine offices across the U.S., wow. shutting down new refugee resettlement in other offices, even though we're continuing to serve those who have already been in the community. And, um, you know, that's, again, representative of the other resettlement agencies as well, where they've seen about a 38% decline overall since um, 2017 in the number of resettlement locations. So that's a challenge. It's not an insurmountable challenge. Um, you know, I know for World Relief, at least, the President-elect Biden's commitment to 125,000 refugee ceiling is something we're celebrating. We think it's a really important symbol to the rest of the world that the U.S. is ready to resume global leadership in terms of resettling some of the most vulnerable cases of, of those who've been persecuted. But it's not gonna be a switch that we turn on overnight. It'll be more of a dimmer switch. So it's, you know, we will be working on building back our capacity as quickly as we can and, and looking to the federal government to assist with that, but also to 
private partnership, but, you know, to church partners, to individuals and foundations that are helping us to reopen some locations or open in some new locations, uh, rehiring staff, uh, you know, hopefully most of the staff we let go in 2017 haven't been waiting around for us for three or four years for their jobs back, but um, we will be doing our very best. And, you know, I'm, I don't think we will hit 125,000 refugees by the end of se next September, but I think that we will certainly do more than we did last year and that we can rebuild that over the course of a number of years. And uh, I, we're excited for that challenge. Great, thank you, Matt. So um, Sandra Sanchez, who I believe is a reporter with uh, Border Reports along the uh, Texas border, just if you don't subscribe to her newsletter, you definitely should. Um, but she asked a question about um, the Title 42 restrictions that the Trump administration put into place, in essence, claiming that the health risks to the United States were so great that uh, in essence, we need to shut down the border. And I think one of the toughest challenges of the many challenges facing a Biden administration will be, how do you reopen the border? Whether it's from a public health perspective or a security perspective. So um, I wanted to maybe kind of expand the question a little bit beyond Title 42 only in terms of lifting the, the health, uh, um, the, the, the concerns about the health of uh, COVID-19. But Elizabeth, for, for your, from your perspective, um, how do you, how would your recommendations in this report apply to the future of asylum and refugee processing along the southern border and you know, potentially as we see continue to see mixed flows from Central America? Absolutely. And, and you're right, like the, the challenges that we face in actually executing and getting to 125,000 are, are pretty significant. Um, on the on the positive side, there's actually quite a few people in the, they, they call it the pipeline, in the pipeline that are ready to come here. So, so the, um, the part of the question about uh, overseas resettlement agencies having to shut down, uh, it's my understanding that, you know, you could turn on the, the spigot, so to speak, and people could show up if we have a way to resettle them. So that, that goes to you know, Matthew's challenge of we, we need to invest and help um, the resettlement agencies that are here domestically to help them have the infrastructure to uh, process. Um, but, but certainly at some point, um, th there hasn't been a lot of processing overseas. And then we, we do have a, a significant challenge on our border um, not only the, the people that have been waiting and, uh, you know, the stories, good reporting um, uh, of, of the stories of what's happening in basically refugee camps on uh, the Mexican side of the southern border, um, you know, we need to address that. That it's uh, the, it, both humanitarian and, and from a security perspective, um, it, it, needs, it needs to be handled. And I don't necessarily know the right way to do that, but I, I definitely think that's a priority that has to be taken into account. And um, given that so much of what we're talking about is going to require uh, more people and budgets, um, I think one of the first steps is to go to Congress with a proposal saying we need funds, appropriated funds, not fee funds, um, to uh, rapidly address uh, both the need down uh, on the southern border for asylee officers and uh, to also rebuild uh, our refugee officer corps. One of the challenges in the um, in Trump administration is to handle some of the inflows that were coming from the southern border and um, the administration's priorities. They moved refugee officers into the asylee officer pool. And um, you know, for, for many, you can imagine if you sign up to be a refugee officer, that's a very different experience, a different lifestyle than to be an asylee officer. You literally are located in different parts of the country, uh, different parts of the world at times. Um, so uh, so th there was kind of a, uh, both a morale hit as well as um, a, uh, a attrition challenge. And um, sadly, the hiring in the federal government is so slow. I mean, that would be a, another inhibitor to us being able to rapidly address this problem. So it, it is um, a very challenging set, I, I would say 12 to 18 months to, to try to address the systemic infrastructure problems. But if the Biden administration could come to the table with, here's our plan, here's where we're trying to go, it helps people like uh, world relief, um, be able to say, okay, we can expect this kind of trajectory and therefore let's start the hiring process. And it helps USCIS start the hiring process. Um, but, but all of this is incumbent upon having a plan and getting Congress to appropriate um, so that we can move that quickly. 
Matt, did you want to uh, speak at all to the, the the path forward at the U.S. Mexico border? Yeah, I mean, I think that the challenge there, of course, is it, our country appropriately has the laws that offer protection to those fleeing a well-founded fear of persecution, and we need to get back to process to ensure that individuals who qualify can, in an efficient manner, be offered that protection, and that you know we are not turning anyone back. And frankly, when there is no due process, plenty of people are turned back who should qualify. Um, at the same time, I think we also need to look at Central America and at the root causes of why people are leaving Central America. And the reality is that's a mix of threats of violence, sometimes from, you know, for reasons that would qualify you for asylum status, sometimes for reasons that are a little bit less clear. Sometimes it's extreme poverty, which isn't ever going to win you an asylum case, but it's very sympathetic. Um, I think there are both ways that the U.S. can encourage, you know, through foreign policy, through foreign aid, can address those root causes of violence, of corruption, of, of poverty. And indeed, we do through USAID, through important partners. And, and a lot of those are, are faith-based organizations. Uh, ironically, the response of the Trump administration to uh, lots of people leaving Central America was to cut foreign assistance to those particular countries. And um, that was not only, I think, morally wrong, it was also very counter-effective. And so we should be investing, um, you know, of course, as World Relief, we want to welcome anyone who, who needs to come here. But we also hate a situation where someone feels that they have no choice but to leave. And, and there are also immigration policies, even beyond, you know, there could be refugee resettlement from Central America where people could be processed and vetted over, you know, overseas and come on an airplane, like through the refugee process or the Central American Minors Program, which lets children who have a, a parent residing lawfully in the United States already be reunited to them on an airplane instead of, you know, coming through a dangerous journey through Mexico. And even looking at temporary work visas, uh, we, we've increased the number of temporary work visas from Mexico in recent years. And that's a significant part of why there's a lot less unauthorized migration from Mexico. And I think for people who really are facing poverty, not a threat of persecution, it'd be great if that was an option to go to the embassy in their hometown when there's an, an economic need in the United States for their labor and redirect them from what is a very dangerous journey. Great, thank you, Matt. And Tyrone, from your perspective, um, you know, the, the, the leadership of the military in terms of, you know, as advocates for refugee resettlement, um, you know, how do we, you know, rebuild that, the endorsement of the military community um, for refugee resettlement? I mean, I remember the days when, you know, General Powell was, you know, and I'm sure he continues to be a, a, an advocate for, for refugees and, and immigration, but it just seems like this is a community moving forward that, um, is going to continue to have a, an outsized impact on the role of the United States in terms of refugee resettlement. Well, you know, what, would love your perspective on, on how we rebuild that, that leadership. I think the leadership is there. So, um, I mean, so really answer your question, the, the, the rebuild isn't necessary. Uh, the problem that's existed for the past four years, which is the arbitrage of the room, is that the leadership over the past four years at the top has been garbage. And so the lower level leaders haven't been able to do those things which they know to be right. Uh, you know, so your, your military leaders, uh, both in and out of uniform, understand uh, the importance of supporting in initiatives uh, such as this because we can't do our jobs in theater without the foreign nationals assistance, no matter how well trained we think we are. All that training goes out the window as soon as you hit the country. And if you don't have the support of the people in the country, then you can't be successful in your mission. Um, so I would say that hopefully, um, as Matt and Elizabeth are saying, that with, with the incoming Biden-Harris administration, with uh, the policies that they wish to promote um, and you know the increase in refugee assistance and improving our infrastructure, uh, that, that uh, leaders will um, follow through um, onset policies and that people will start doing the right things by these people. And I also want to um, caveat on, the what, on to what Matt was saying earlier with Central America. I had a mentor who, or he's still my mentor, who was the commander of Joint Task Force Honduras. Um, this is maybe 15 years ago, um, 10 years ago. And he stressed to me the fact that, you know, the United States does some good work in Central America, but we are horrible at marketing and promoting and letting people know that we actually are doing the work. And so back in the days of Hugo Chavez, you know, we would go out and, you know, we provide assistance, medical, human relief, whatever, however, whatever you would define it. But we wouldn't promote ourselves. We wouldn't even have like a US flag stamped on a box. And Chavez would go in there and he put his name on these boxes. 
And so all the locals were thinking Venezuela was doing, Hugo Chavez was doing all these great things for their people when in fact it was the United States. Um, and so not that, you know, we need to be pushing American exceptionalism, but those few times that we are being exceptional, <laughs> we at least let the people know that we are doing something. <laughs> Uh, I think we're all hoping that there are some ex exceptional days ahead of us. Um, so let, I have one last question. I, I want to kind of put this to the panel as kind of your closing comments. And, you know, let's say you're sitting down with the transition team, you know, the head of the State Department, the head of DHS. Um, you know, these are the folks, they and their teams are really going to be grappling with these questions of, okay, how do we uh, get our refugee resettlement uh, uh, number back to 125? From your perspectives, and you said this in different ways, but I just thought it would be good to kind of put a bow on this. What are the top three things that D, uh, Homeland Security and state uh, leadership should be thinking about from a national security perspective, as well as a humanitarian perspective to reach that number? So Elizabeth, let me, let me turn over to you first. Okay, top three things. Uh, I, I think the first thing is you've got to pay attention to the thing that's not that exciting, which is you've got to figure out the budgets, you've got to figure out how to hire fast, you've got to figure out how to do the infrastructure and um, uh, make sure the National Vetting Center is being supported by all of the parties that have to support it. Um, anytime you do multi-agency projects, which is what the NVC is, it's very easy for everybody to be like, well, that's not m my agency's top priority. I'm gonna, you know, I'll get to you later after I finish what my boss says my top priority is. It's, that's, that's the place where presidential leadership saying this has to be done really, really matters. So it's not exciting, but doing that bureaucratic work of prioritization and getting the money so that we can actually build out the infrastructure so you can actually do the process of moving somebody and resettling them here in the United States. That, I, honestly, that's like almost one, two, and three, but I, I will add um, maybe the, the second thing for them to focus on is uh, recognizing that, I guess it would be a caution. Maybe that's the way to put it. My caution is in the um, pressure, the way, the way that bureaucracies work, when the signal is sent, we got to get to 125. And maybe everybody understands like it's unlikely to happen in FY21 between pandemics and all sorts of other things that have to be cleaned up after the Trump administration. But I guarantee you by FY22, they're going to be watching the numbers and you know, where are we? Why, wh where's the log jam? How do, we, how do we move things? So the bureaucratic tendency is to focus on that number and, and something usually gets sacrificed. And in that sacrifice, that's where the pendulum swing can come from and you, where you're least expecting it. So part of the reason I'm speaking out as a, as a, I don't even know if I'm a Republican anymore, but historic Republican maybe is the best word to put it. Um, and as a conservative, I think it's entirely within uh, a conservative's viewpoint that we should welcome uh, immigrants and refugees. They make our country stronger and it's good for national security. Uh, but don't give the nativists and the populace the, the argument for them. So make sure we do the security right. Um, I, and I, I lay out the case in this paper. We have done, we've done great. We, refugees are more vetted than any other population. I, I am not concerned uh, today that if we implement the vetting center right, we, we will do as good as we can humanly possibly do. Um, but don't, uh, don't play into the nativist hands and give them the excuse to shut everything down again in four years with, with the, uh, the pendulum swing. So make sure you, you stay committed to security. Thank you. Tarun. I agree with everything Elizabeth said, and Matt's probably going to say something technical as well. So I want to say something a little more strategic and spiritual in nature and that you know, we have to get to a point to where we're crafting policy. Um, and this one is even more important because we're really talking about people and their lives. And policymakers and decision makers and those executing policy, at, policy have to ask themselves, who are we as Americans? And how are we gonna craft these policies that express what being America is? And so if being you know, America as a country, as a nation means you know, taking in the poor and assisting them 
um, assisting those who want a better life for themselves and for their prodigy, then we have to ensure that that, that spirit is, is laced within all the policy that we're writing and how we're crafting it. Uh, because as one of my, as my former congressman once said to Elizabeth's point, you, can, you know how your elected leaders care about the policies you care about by how they appropriate. So it's, we're past the time of talk and we are now to the time of action. And if being America is what we all believe it is to be, then we have to ensure that, that we are expressing that through our action. Thank you. And then Matt. Yeah, I won't give you three points because I think both of those two would be my first two. But um, just to add, you know, I think, you know, Elizabeth said we need to make sure we don't give a reason to shut the program down again in four years. And I completely agree. I, I want to be safe like everyone else. But the reality is it didn't take a reason to shut the program down. Um, it, there wasn't a dramatic failure of the refugee vetting process. But what I think we need to do a much better job of is telling the story of refugee resettlement. And, um, you know, I wish every American would read Jessica Goudeau's book, After the Last Border. It's just a beautiful, really written narrative of two refugees who've been resettled to the United States. You know, for, for Christians like me, who's, you know, one Sunday a year at least, we're focused on the persecuted church. I wish we would know that when you shut down refugee resettlement, that is shutting down persecuted Christians and other religious minorities fleeing persecution to the United States. And I think that, you know, most people just don't realize that. Uh, you know, I think the stories of the way that people from Iraq and from Afghanistan are refugees, are persecuted because they served alongside the U.S. military in ways that I've never done and probably never will. They have risked more for this country than the vast majority of Americans ever will. And I think that that's a compelling and true story. And then to help people understand the very thorough vetting process that we have had in place that sure should continually be improved but there's no record of significant failure here it's actually a remarkably strong record of keeping out the wrong people and bringing in people who who legitimately meet the legal definition of of a refugee and um you know i think the more that we can tell those stories and help remind people that this is Part of the American story, for those of us who are coming at this from a faith perspective, it's deeply rooted with our convictions. Um, I think that that story needs to be told over and over again so that we're, so it's unthinkable that we would ever turn our back again on refugees. Thank you, Matt. And I wanna thank Elizabeth Newman for um, uh, writing the report that you can find at immigrationforum.org. Uh, Tyrone Sim, it's, Sims, excuse me. It's uh, wonderful to, to have you with us and we hope we have a chance to work with you more in the future. And then Matt Sorens, uh, from our good partners at World Relief. Again, thank you everybody so much for joining. Um, go to our website, immigrationforum.org for access to this report and other information. And uh, we will see you the next time. Thank you. <laughs>